and it was nice seeing you on Monday. All right, back to what I was saying. Even as a sophomore, we can say that the most acidic is the hydrochloric acid. It puts 100% of its ions into solution and that the potassium hydroxide is the most basic because it puts 100% of its hydroxide ions in, into the solution. And it is important that we recognize that the hydrogen concentration and the hydroxide concentration in water will always adjust to make up for whatever it is that you've added. So in the first one, if you add a whole bunch of hydrogen ions, then what happens is the hydroxide ions are going to uh, compensate by being much, much less in order to make up for that. Uh, if you have a 0.1 molar solution, we're talking about one times 10 to the negative first power, right? So what that tells us that the hydroxide concentration has to be is one times 10 to the negative 13th. So instead of it being the normal neutral water that has one times 10 to the negative seventh and one times 10 to the negative seventh, can you see how this has adjusted to make up for the massive amount of hydrogen ion that has been added to, this, to the water, okay? Absurdly important that we uh, know that See if I can get the chat back up. Uh, see, now I screwed everything up, so I might not be able to get it to stay. Nope, I blew it. Let's start, do the share over again. Good, there we go. All right, so those two are the easy ones. Now, the next one that is kind of easy, this isn't necessarily something for a honors chemistry student to understand, but it's something that an AP chemistry student, we would say this is a pretty easy one, is that right in the middle is the potassium chloride, because when potassium chloride gets put into water, it 100% dissociates into its ions. But the problem, maybe not the problem, the issue here is that both of these ions are the conjugates to strong acids and strong bases, okay? So the ability, let's pick on the, the chloride first. We would say that the chloride is the conjugate base to this strong acid, right? In the bronsted lowry theory of explaining things, this is our um, acid, this is our conjugate base. This reaction has no ability to go back the opposite direction. So in other words, chloride has no ability to pull hydrogen ions out of the water. So in our neutral water that I have listed up here, when you drop potassium chloride in there, these chlorides are not able to bind with the hydrogens and form hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid is not a weak acid. Potassiums, based on this reaction down here, this is the conjugate acid to a very strong, ba strong base, but I'm spelling base incorrectly. And because of it being a strong base, potassium does not have the ability to find the hydroxides that water has already put in there and bind up with them and form potassium hydroxide. Therefore, these two ions do not adjust the neutrality of water. It stays balanced at one times 10 to the negative seventh for each of them, and therefore the pH stays seven. Do we understand? So far, does that make sense? Because now we get to the two hard ones. Now we have to try to decide what to do with the ammonium chloride and with the potassium cyanate, okay, or cyanide. So um, for those, let's go down to the bottom of the page and write down what we think might happen with them because I don't know where to slot them in. But I will say this, on an AP test, that out of the four answer choices that are there, two of the answer choices probably already break these uh, this scenario here of labeling these as most acidic, middle, and most basic, the what goes in for number two and what goes in for number four is going to be taking those other two uh, salts that we have up here and just flip-flopping which one goes where. So one of the answers is right and one of the answers is wrong, which means that you're now at a 50-50 chance of getting this right. And statistically, a 50-50 chance throughout your entire AP test should make you pass the AP test, okay? So that's what we're, you know, a good, uh, happy first step to this is the idea that we can 
narrow this down at least. But let's see if we can actually get this one right. So now I'm going to take the two salts that are here, KCN, and I'm going to dissolve this into water. I'm doing it down here because I don't know where to put it into my, uh, my slots up here. This puts potassium ions and cyanide ions into solution, okay? Now, we've already established that potassium ions have no ability to push this reaction, so they have no ability to pull hydroxide out of the solution. Therefore, they have no ability to make the solution more acidic. But the cyanide, we've already seen KAs and KBs listed for, uh, uh, well, it's a KA that's listed for its related weak acid, which says that there is a KA on your sheet, and it would be on the on the question for the test as well, that there is a Ka for HCN. Of course, I don't know what it is, but the fact that one is listed tells us that HCN has the ability to dissociate as hydrogen ions and cyanide ions, all right? So if that's true, that this is a reaction that does have an equilibrium, then that tells me that the, the cyanide ions have the ability to react with neutral water because neutral water is already putting a few hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions in solution, that it can react with this, form HCN, and leave a few more hydroxide ions in solution than what would be at neutral. So therefore, what just happened is by adding this salt, we just made the solution more basic. Not as basic as potassium hydroxide does. A strong base is always going to win the fight. But we can now say that the uh, KCN slides in right here. Um, I don't really need to write its breakdown again, but I don't know, maybe if we want to keep a continuity to this. And then maybe I'll point an arrow. Uh, I don't know if I want to point an arrow there. What if I instead just say the words, this is the, uh, I want to switch colors. This is the, I got to go down to here, right here. This is the conjugate base to a weak acid, right? So that's kind of if they asked us to justify how we chose. Now, it'd be a multiple choice question. We don't have to justify anything on multiple choice, but we do have to make sure we understand. All right, now, if that confused you, let's look at what happens with the... Um, the ammonium chloride and see if we can come up with the same idea with that one. So it would have been nice if I had left myself room here. Can I squeeze in the ammonium chloride right here? So NH4Cl, when it dissociates into the ammonium ions and the chloride ions, um, we already know that chloride ions have no ability to go backward and bind up with hydrogens in the water and form hydrogen chloride or hydrochloric acid. So therefore, we don't need to worry about them. But the ammonium ions, we've seen enough times that ammonia is actually listed as a weak base. So there is a reaction that says that NH4, ah, uh, no, 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 that's not what I want to say. There is a reaction that we've seen a bunch of times that says NH3 can react with water to form NH4 plus and leave hydro plus and leave hydroxides in solution. Okay, so if that's true, then that means that we can say that by somebody adding ammonium chloride, remember they didn't add ammonia to the solution, they added ammonium chloride salt. By adding that ammonium chloride salt, the ammonium ions that dissociated from the salt have the ability to, I don't know, it would be difficult for me to write this this way uh, and try to break up the waters. I think instead what I prefer to do to write this out is, and I just feel like I'm off by half a step today. I'll explain all of that to you guys in a few minutes here, is that we are going to form ammonia and put hydrogen ions in solution. So this is something that can form an equilibrium. Therefore, we've just put hydrogen ions in solution and we've made the solution slightly acidic. And so therefore, I can slot in my ammonium chloride right here and say that the ammonium chloride, because it associates to put ammonium ions in there, 
and chloride ions in there, that this is a conjugate acid, right? We would consider it a conjugate acid because it's releasing hydrogen ions to a weak base. And there's your order, okay? Um, is there something that you could memorize here? Could you memorize that when you see, I don't know, I was gonna to try to talk about this in terms of the ions. When you see a cation that's part of a weak system, that that cation makes the solution acidic. And when you see an anion that's part of a, a weak system, that that makes the solution basic. I don't know, that just seems like extra memorizing. I'll be honest with you, this kind of question right here, I can't just solve these ones by that memorization process because it's too easy to forget that. I actually have to write them out and think about the stuff that I've done in green in order to get this right. Okay, so now on the slides, I walked you through all of these steps. So you maybe just looked at these slides here when you were getting your answers. You need to make sure that you understand this process because this is not that hard. And every question that you get right is bringing you closer to your goal on your AP test. And there's going to be things that you guys are going to miss because we're not going to get to cover them in that kind of depth. So we got to get these kinds of ones correct. Question number 30, given that the Ka value for acetic acid is 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth and the Ka value for hypochlorous acid is 3.5 times 10 to the negative eight, which is a stronger base, the hypochlorite or the acetate ion. If you're like me, you can look at that and go, I don't have any idea. So what I do is I actually write it out. The test is short enough now that there's enough time for you to work out all of the problems. So if they talk about the Ka for acetic acid, then we know that that has something to do with the acetate ion. So to turn acetate ion into an acid, I'm just gonna attach a hydrogen ion to it and then dissociate it and go into an equilibrium uh, situation, which I will then turn that into an expression as Ka equals the hydrogen times the acetate over the acetic acid. Okay, so there's one of them. And then the other one dealing with the hypochlorous acid, I'm gonna do the same thing. I'll turn it into an acid by putting H, whether you put HClO or HOCl, probably you're gonna put HOCl because of the fact that it says OCl there. In equilibrium with H plus and OCl, all right? And then we put a Ka is equal to hydrogen times hypochlorite divided by the hypochlorous acid. And I just wrote it the other way. Okay, so now we're ready to start thinking about what this means. So they gave us a Ka value, 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth. And we know that that is the number that we're keying on here. And down here we have 3.5 times 10 to the negative eighth, and I'm still keying on the exponent. So the fact that this says 10 to the negative fifth means that the Ka for this one is a thousand times stronger than the Ka for this one, which means this acid is a thousand times stronger acid than the hypochlorous acid. That tells me this reaction is going to proceed further to the products, and this reaction is not going to proceed as far to the products. Okay, so I'm going to write right below this stronger acid equals weaker conjugate base. Down here, weaker acid equals stronger conjugate base. Now I'll go up and answer the question, which is the stronger uh, base? It must be the hypochlorite ion is the stronger base because it's part of a, of a system, part of an equilibrium with a weaker acid. Also, number 30, very important question. These are the kinds of things that you see these on the AP multiple choice questions every year. And I imagine that I just have students who sit there and go, I don't know, I'm just gonna pick this one. And obviously, you know, how often you get a one in four shot. I don't even know what they would do to give you two other answer choices for something like this, but um, whatever. So 
that's that. Any questions on the first homework assignment before we move to the second homework assignment? How do you know if it's a strong acid or weak acid if the K is not given? Exactly, you wouldn't. Um, if they don't give you the KA, like for example, in question number 29, they didn't list any KAs for anything. Uh, the only ones that we can say for sure are these ones here, right? So we could say that this is a strong base because group one bases are always strong. We can say that this is a strong acid because we see hydrochloric acid enough times that we know that it's going to be strong. But in the end, Francisco, they have to tell you the KA. If they really want you to be able to do a problem, like number 30, this is pretty, this is pretty legit for how a question would be written. Okay, so they do have to give us the KA. Now, it would be possible in a homework assignment to not give the KA, like in the previous problem, not giving you the KAs that were associated with these two ions, because technically your textbook is relying on you looking at the table of KAs that's in the textbook. And because I know that most of my students don't check out the textbook, I just print that out as a handout and give it to the students to use so they can get the KAs from it. But slowly over time, I have been adding in the KAs and KBs for all of these problems because of the fact that I know that students don't even know where that piece of paper is. So let's just count on they're going to give it to you. Okay, good question though. All right, I think that finished up questions from this once again, I have some beautiful slides made up explaining all of this stuff here. And this one, I even threw an extra little slide in here as a reminder on bronsted lowry theory that whenever you're dealing with a equilibrium expression, that if something is strong on one side, that means that the other thing is weak on the other side, okay? So the ability for the chlorides to go backward and bind up with hydrogens to form hydrogen chloride or hydrochloric acid, just not going to happen. But down here for the acetates, they can do that. Okay. And then there's your answer again, uh, is by looking at the KAs or KBs that are listed. All right. And so then more salts is what we had as our second assignment. And then today's notes. Try that again. Feel like I got like I've got 1970s man hair going on today. Need to put a beanie on. Make myself. Uh, you know what I'll do? I just won't look at myself. I'll just put you guys. Um, Nicole, there is a uh, locator card here for you. So if you think that you need it for your next class, Rambo area, yeah, exactly, exactly right. If you think you need the uh, locator card for your uh, third period today, it's just sitting right at the end of my table. Um, I don't know if you're actually on campus yet or if you're going to come or not at all. I don't know. Um, and I hope it's okay that I talk about it publicly uh, in front of everybody else. If by chance you do come here on Thursdays and it's just the two of us, most likely I'm going to find out. I'm going to email Mrs. Stewart and find out. But I think that they're just going to have students that are in single classes with creepy old men um, that they would just go into the library and, and just Zoom. So if, if that's how that works. Because the problem now is if you Zoom from home and you've got to be here for fifth or third period, how are you going to get here in the five minutes? So I don't have any answers to any of that. So therefore, I'm just going to shut up now and start talking about, uh, oh, you are in the library and you don't need a card. Okay, sounds good. You guys are hiding my, um, there it is. Okay. Question number 31 says, sodium azide is sometimes added to water to kill bacteria. Calculate the concentration of all species in a 0 0.01 molar solution of sodium azide. The Ka value for hydrozoic acid, HN3, is 1.9 times 10 to the negative fifth. Um, okay, so first thing that we can say about this is we are not dealing with an acid or a base yet. We are dealing with a salt. 
Everybody sees that there are no H's and no OH's present. And no, that's not a good answer because even when you guys are looking at like ammonia or some of those other weird bases that we had back in the chapter section on bases, you didn't see either hydrogen ions or hydroxide ions either. Um, you need to know that this is a salt because of the fact that the sodium ion is there, right? You need to know that something is a salt because the chloride ion is present. And the only reason why you would say that sodium is not part of a salt is if it said sodium hydroxide, then you would know that the sodium is part of a base. If it said chloride was part of HCl, then you would know that the chloride is part of an acid. But otherwise, anything that they're with must be a salt. So this is a salt. You put it into water, and if you've got 0.1 molar uh, solution of sodium azide, what you really have then is because it 100% dissociates, is you have 0 0.01 molar of the two ions is actually what's there. Now, the sodium ions, we don't care anything about them. They are a spectator. For those of you who have been paying attention on your FRQs, you've noticed now, now one of them might actually have just been uh, assigned to you yesterday or might even be for next week because I don't know exactly where I am in my prep compared to my posting. But now twice I have done problems where the very first thing they asked us to do was to write the net ionic equation. And in both of those problems, the net ionic equation did not then include the sodium ions because sodium is a 100 percenter in terms of staying as an ion and not able to go bind up with anything and form either a precipitate or also in this case, a uh, remove hydroxides and form an acid, okay? So it's out. So the only thing that matters then is this azide ion that, or trinitride ion that we have there. And we know that it's a conjugate to a weak acid because they listed a Ka for it. All right, so because we see the Ka, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that ion and I'm going to place it into water. And I'm a teacher who's done this forever. And yet still, I take the time to write this out because I just don't feel confident enough to do it in my head. So when I write it out, I'm going to say that the N3 reacts with water. And then I'm going to decide how does it break water up? Well, because it's negative, it's attracted to the positive and it forms HN3. And then what it does is leaves hydroxides in solution. So by putting this salt into water, we can now say that it made the water more basic. But this is more than that. They want to know how basic by asking us. They just asked us for the concentration. I was about to say the pH, and I'll, I wouldn't doubt that I ended up finding the pH because that's what I do. I'm so used to that being the main question that I just do that. All right, so we have 0.01 molar. We have none of this at the start, but then immediately this starts robbing hydrogen ions and X amount of it disappears and forms X amount of that, but then also forms X amount of that. And so when I go to write my expression, it's not a Ka this time, it's a Kb. Why do I know it's a Kb? Because hydroxide is in the numerator. It's only a Ka if hydrogen is in the numerator, right? So if that has escaped you, if you haven't noticed that occurring, Whenever it happens that you finally go, oh, I get it. Awesome. We just need that to happen before your chapter test and then continue that into your AP test. So this has to be a KB. They didn't, of course, give us a KB because they never do because they're dirty. So what we have to do is find the KB by saying that 1.9 times 10 to the negative fifth KA times KB equals KW. Sometimes you get lucky and you'll have a uh, you'll have a sheet that actually lists both of them. I think the one that we have in class actually lists the KB and each acid slash co uh, conjugate base pair. Um, anyway, I'm going to cheat to the next slide here so that I can see what that value is. KB is 5.3 times 10 to the negative 10th. Okay, so now that I have the KB, I can now go over here and put 5.3 times 10 to the negative 10th equals X times X over 0.01 minus X and solve. Then I get my concentration. In fact, I think that's even what the answer is, is that we just needed the concentrations of these. 
So solving for X, that tells me these two, and then you subtract that from 0.01, but you can see that it's completely negligible. You're down in the millionth place as opposed to the hundredth place is negligible. That's a good problem right there. And I'm telling you right now, you're gonna be doing this on your chapter test. So make sure that 31, that you put a little star by it because you're gonna be doing this on your chapter test. Can I go to 32? All right, calculate the pH of each of the following solutions. All right, actually 32 is more test worthy than 31 because I don't ask you for the concentration. I actually ask you for the pH. So um, you put sodium cyanide into solution, okay? This is the stuff that they use like uh, Jim Jones used this down in um, uh, the Jonestown massacre in, in South America when he took all of his religious followers from up here in America down there and they were a big religious cult. And then they heard that the feds were coming to get them. And so he had everybody drink sodium cyanide punch and hundreds, if not thousands of people died. And you might sit there thinking, how on earth could they do that? And my answer to you is, haven't you seen all the Humpty flags all over town? Because there's people out there who are just cults of personality and other people are sheep and they just fall in line to the cult of personality. So in other words, I'm glad that I'm with, I get to teach classes like I teach because I think you're all free thinkers. You don't have to be a Democrat. You don't have to be a Republican, but I like the idea that you'd be critically thinking about your choices and wouldn't just follow somebody because of their uh, cult of personality. So cyanide, you know it's dangerous. You've heard of it before. When this gets dissolved in water, it puts all of its molarity as ions. Okay, we've already talked about sodium being part of the spectator list in our net ionic equation, so we're not concerned with it. It will not form sodium hydroxide and leave the solution acidic. But cyanide will form the hydrocyanic acid and leave the solution basic. Okay, but maybe that's not something that's easy for you to think of. So what you should do then is take your CNs, write them as reacting with waters so that you can go, oh, I see what happened here. The CN is going to be attracted to the positive ion in the water and form HCN and then leave behind the negative ion. There's proof that it became basic. Then I, E, uh, 0.05, minute it hits the water, it starts this process going and X amount of it reacts to form X amount of this and X amount of this. And we're doing the exact same things we just did in the last problem. KB, HCN times OH divided by CN, okay? We need a KB, which means that you have to take your KA and divide that into one times 10 to the negative 14th. We're gonna get something times 10 to the negative fifth and then X times X over 0.05 minus X. Solve for X, once you get your X, the problem with that X is that X is actually the hydroxide concentration. So therefore, when you go to do the P stuff, ah, see, and I wrote down pH. When you go to do the P stuff, you're actually finding the POH equals negative log of whatever X is, and then you have to subtract that number from 14. Like all, oh, I didn't solve it out though. All I did was just the concentration. So I didn't finish this problem. POH equals negative log of 8.9 times 10 to the negative fourth. That's going to come out to be three point something. And then pH equals 14 minus that value. I'll solve it. We're having fun. I'll solve it. Negative log of 8.9 times 10 to the negative fourth. Ah, I just screwed that all up. And I just also want to say while I'm solving this that I think that next time we meet together, 8.9 times 10 to the negative fourth, I think we do need to start answering questions for Candy. Because when Yvette put that into the um, chat the other day, you're not going to give out Jolly Ranchers. I thought, no, no, you're right. That's not fair. And then I thought about it and I'm like, 
That is fair. 11 or 10, 10.95. Because you know what I would love to have happen? I would love to have the rest of you who are at home feel so much FOMO that you decide to re-enroll at Granite Hills High School for the rest of the year. Because now that we've all been here for a couple days, everybody's wearing their mask. Did you know that in a society where 100% of the people wear their masks, nobody catches COVID? So therefore this place is really, really safe to be at because nobody's like making a stand. I haven't heard of or seen one student who hasn't worn their mask. The closest thing is that Oz has his mask down and his nose is showing a little bit. Well, they've kind of shown that that's not that unsafe either because it's really spewing out of a person's mouth is where the dangerous germs are coming from. So you're safe here. So please try to maybe think about asking your parents if it would be okay for you to come back to school. I know you don't want to get up early, but this is part of what we do in life. So I think you should try to start thinking about reconsidering and coming in. Let's finish off the year like civilized human beings that are being students. Not that you're not civilized at home. You're very civilized. But uh, of all of my classes, I believe that my first period class had the most fun. And I believe it's because there were so many people. My other classes had these looks of dread and agony the entire period. And I think it's because they felt weird when they were only one of four or five people that were present. I'm not going to mail you the candy because then uh, who's going to pay the postage, right? We could keep the candies. Uh, I, well, Kumar, see, you're a person that's, that is, uh, in it, I'm not going to say that you're better than everybody else. I mean, that might be true, but the more correct way for me to say it is, you don't take this for granted. You've been denied this longer than anybody. So for you, um, it's just a uh, good situation all around. Uh, I mean, I don't know, that doesn't sound right. Good situation all around. Maybe it's not good all around, but you definitely don't take it for granted. All right, chapter 15.1. This is an important section here. We've got 35 minutes. I'm going to use up that whole time. So if you're sitting there right now going, oh, Gosh, I hope this class doesn't go till 8.15. Uh, it's going to go till 8.15. I might even keep you till like 8.17. In fact, there'd be no reason why we couldn't work all the way till 8.20 because with the exception of Nicole, everybody else is at home today. So you don't have any time constraints other than you just have to enter a new Zoom right at 8.20. So I'm going to keep you. But I should get started. That way, maybe I don't keep you that long. Describe the equilibrium shift if sodium fluoride is added. Okay. I shouldn't even need to do this one for you. You guys should be able to look at this and say, okay, what's going to happen if sodium fluoride is added? So maybe if you're not 100% sure yet, you would start by saying, what is sodium fluoride? Well, sodium fluoride is, except for I forgot the A, is NaF. And what is that? It's a salt. Uh, the review, I think next if you turn it in early, I'd give more points on the, cur on the curve for the test. And I think that that's whatever day we start reviewing. That's still a, a while. So why you started it, that, it's fine, but you still got a while. Um, I can flash the calendar at the end of the period and we can take a look. So sodium fluoride 100% dissociates into solution. Okay, so my question to you is, if you add sodium ions to this solution, I don't know which side of the, yeah, I know what to do. Forget about adding them to the other side of the equation. Let's talk about our solution here that has HFs, Hs, and Fs floating around in solution, and you decide to add sodium fluoride. Will those sodium ions do anything to any part of this reaction? Will they bind up with the fluorides? No, because they already dissociated from fluorides. Will they bind up with hydrogens? Of course not, they have the same charge. Will they bind up with the hydrogen fluorides and form this really famous NAHF? You'd be the first person to discover it if that's the truth of what they could possibly do. So in other words, still sodiums are spectators to this reaction and they have no effect. But what about the fluorides? If you all of a sudden put more fluorides in here, you have upset the delicate balance that is called equilibrium. 
In other words, by Le Chatelier's principle, we would say that you added more fluoride ions. And Le Chatelier's principle says, if you add something to a reaction, you cause that reaction to have to shift to make up for that stress that you just put on it. Remember that we have for this that says H plus times F minus over HF. And if you all of a sudden go and increase this number to a bigger number, then the reaction is going to have to try to shift downward a little bit in order to go back to reestablish the correct Ka for this reaction. So mathematically, you can see why it's happening. And then also conceptually with the Chatelier's principle, you can see why this is happening. We all good on that? Because once again, these are the kinds of concept questions that show up on the multiple choice part of the test. And I get such a low passing rate on this test that tells me that people don't know these things. And I honestly think that why people don't know these things is because they don't write it down. Remember that an AP multiple choice test doesn't have anything written there other than it'll say, describe the equilibrium shift. If sodium fluoride is added to a hydrogen fluoride or hydrofluoric acid solution, right? It's just written in a bunch of words. And then my students go, hmm, I'm going to pick letter B, right? And if you pick letter B, you just got a one in four chance of getting it right. And a 25% will not pass the AP test. So you have to write things down. That's why they gave you that booklet to write in. So please write it out and then hopefully you're able to figure the, the um, concept out there. Question two. All right, so yesterday I got up in the morning, did some schoolwork, and then at about eight o'clock after I knew everything was collected, assigned, and all that stuff, I took advantage of the time and went out for a mountain bike ride. Uh, I drove out into the Stoddard Valley and then unloaded my mountain bike and went for a ride north towards Barstow. Um, nothing that eventful other than it's just gorgeous out there. Get out past where the people motorcycle and ride their side by side so the dirt's not all chewed up. And there's beautiful single tracks out there. Saw a beautiful coyote, came home. Um, then uh, wife and I went, took the dog running. So by this point now, I'm just totally exhausted. Uh, and um, then came back home. And at some point as the afternoon was approaching, it was time for me to find the tortoises. We have two desert tortoises that live in our yard. I'm, they're domesticated. They were born in captivity. And, and because we don't have very many weeds this year, because it hasn't rained at all, I actually go out and feed them lettuce and that kind of stuff. So I'm looking for them, and as I'm looking for them in one of the burrows that they'll stay in, I can see the fattest part of a big fat gopher snake in there. So I'm like, oh, that's cool. So I brought the wife out there to see it, and we're happy because I thought I had killed our, our gopher snake a couple of years ago um, because late in the year, like probably like maybe September, October, when I don't go around the yard as often, uh, in one of the um, uh, fruit tree nettings, there was a snake stuck in it and it was dead. And I was like, oh man, we've had the same gopher snake living in our yard for like, I don't know, at least eight years. I've watched it grow up since it was really little and it keeps the rodent population in our yard down, but it startles me all the time. One time it had just caught something and eaten it and it was big and fat in the middle and it was, it was crawling on a, um, a little concrete wall that I have in the backyard that's got a chain link fence about as thick as the snake is right there. And the snake was so fat with this rodent in it as it swore, as it kind of, you know, did its little S turns, it fell off the wall and landed on the ground. So I got to laugh at it, right? How often do you see a snake uh, slip and fall? Um, so anyway, I thought I killed it. I don't think that that was the snake because the snake that was dead was smaller. And this one here was bigger, which would match the age and how well fed that the snake is. So I'm really happy to see that I got my snake back or that my snake's been there all along. Um, so I got to see a snake, uh, saw the tortoises, of course, saw a coyote. Then um, in the afternoon, I went with a group of people and we went out and cleaned up in the desert. We went and picked up trash and uh, it was really bad. There was a spot where somebody's been living and finally they've left and the trash they left was so much that it was overwhelming for any of us to do. And somebody volunteered to bring a trailer out, 10 people. We loaded all the trash in there. While I'm doing that, I saw a roadrunner on the way out, so that's cool. I had a roadrunner to the list. But while we're doing that, I'm reaching behind stuff 
Hold on, I'll be right back. Man, I can't find it. I found a hundred dollar bill, All right? So I find a hundred dollar bill, which is cool because I was going to donate fifty dollars to the person with the trailer to uh, dump the trash at the dump, right? So I'm like, all right, the person who left here lost a hundred dollar bill, which is karma, and therefore now they have to pay for the, the dump fee. So I gave the hundred dollar bill to the person who had the trailer. And everybody's laughing and going, wow. Well, anyway, somebody looks at it and goes, that's not a real $100 bill. It was fake. So I'm like, well, I want it back. So um, I have a fake, a counterfeit $100 bill here. I'm going to hang it from the um, whiteboard for the rest of the year, for the rest of the time that I teach here and see what people think. But anyway, that was me. Uh, and then on the way home, another gopher snake while I was driving. So that was yesterday. So I'm exhausted today. Today, coming uh, to school, out in front of school, I imagine that probably Nate hit this over the wall probably yesterday and didn't go pick it up. Is that true? Yeah, there's a lot of people dumping trash right now. That's part of, part of my complaint about the last four years also is that when you have a leader who basically tells everybody in this country, I only care about myself, then everybody else goes, yeah, I only care about myself. And then they do stupid stuff like this. So... Uh, I hope that we, as a society, come back together and recognize that uh, we need to do things better. Some of us, I think, already think that way. In a one molar hydrogen fluoride solution, we found the last chapter that it puts this kind of concentration of hydrogen ions in solution and it dissociated to 2.7%. Now, what we're going to do in this problem here is we're going to buffer this solution. And we're going to do that by, at the start, I'm using the wrong color, but it's okay. That we can say that there is one molar hydrogen fluoride mixed with one molar fluoride ions. Would you all agree that this means ions that are present? So I can skip the steps now of showing that dissociation and we can just recognize that who we care about in this equilibrium, there's already one molar present. Okay, so then we know that in order for this to go to equilibrium, the only direction that it can shift is it has to shift to the right because there is no hydrogen ions of consequence. There's waters, but not very many of them. So therefore, it makes more sense that this will shift to the right and we'll get uh, one minus X, X, and one plus X in solution. Okay, then... What we already know how to do is to say that a Ka equals H times F divided by HF. And then now we start putting in the stuff that we already know how to do from chapter 14. But now all of a sudden something different happens, but it's a good thing, so don't be worried about it. Is instead of just X times X, it's really X times one plus X, all divided by one minus X. Now, if X is negligible, then that means that we can say that this and this don't need to be counted, and it really becomes X times one over one, which then means that our answer for X is 7.2 times 10 to the negative fourth molar. Now, do you notice that up there when we did this question in chapter 14, the answer came out to be 2.7 times 10 to the negative second molar when it reached equilibrium. In other words, there was a hundred times more hydrogen ions in solution when it wasn't buffered. 
But your textbook knows that to say that to students is like, you know, it's going to cause them to really not think about it. So then what they had us do was also do a percent dissociation so that we could say that the percent equals 7.2 times 10 to the negative fourth divided by the original concentration of one and then times that by 100 percent. And then when that's all said and done, that comes out to be 0.07, I think, 0.07 percent. So the percentage went from 2.7 down to only 0.07, 100 percent or 100 times smaller percentage. And that's because of the fluoride ions. That's called a buffered solution. Now, some things that we should say about this is conceptually, can, does it make sense why this happened? If I asked you to find the pH of this solution, you'd take the pH of this and get that it comes out to be somewhere near like 3.2, whereas the pH of this solution is gonna come out to be something like 1.5, right? So the pH didn't go nearly as low as the hydrogen fluoride all by itself. How could you explain that in terms of Le Chatelier's principle? Well, for this reaction to proceed forward, it's pushing up against this, right? The fluoride ions that are present there aren't allowing this reaction to proceed forward with as much force as it would normally when it would be zero and zero. If it's zero and zero, the reaction has to proceed quite a ways forward to actually reach that equilibrium spot. But now with already one molar fluoride ions there, it's hard for it to push forward and therefore it doesn't get as far, okay? That's example two. I'm gonna keep moving forward because uh, now we, I'm supposed to do titrations today, I think also. Maybe not. Maybe it's just the one. Hold on, just taking a look at the notes here. Yeah, good. I'm really happy to see that I don't, I, I, I mean, there's still a lot of notes, but uh, next time's notes are really long. These ones are just sort of long. Example two. Um, there's always a way to check that the 5% rule is applicable. And you do that by once you solve for your answer for this, is you compare it to the original concentration. And you would just do uh, this number. I mean, really the percent dissociation kind of shows the 5% rule, doesn't it? So uh, as long as it's less than 5% and both of these were, we didn't need to worry about the X. But I'm gonna tell you that on your chapter test and on the AP test, the 5% rule will always be applicable that you'll always just cross out the X but you also know how to do your calculator. So therefore uh, you can choose because either way you're gonna get the same answer. All right, so what buffered solutions do is they try to prevent changes in pH. And we know that things like your blood are buffered solutions because otherwise when you eat those flaming hot Cheetos, uh, your pancreas has to protect you from the massive influx of um, simple sugars that you put in your body. And then your blood has to have a buffered solution to protect you from the fact that you've just changed the pH. Uh, and we don't want ma uh, major changes in pH in your blood or probably it would kill you. I'm not a biologist or a doctor, but probably would be pretty unsafe. So you've got five molar acetic acid and five molar sodium acetate right away. There's a salt. We're going to assume that it is 100% dissociating so that at the start, we've got 0.5 molar and 0.5 molar of each of those two conjugates in this equilibrium. Now we have no hydrogen ions. We know we have one times 10 to the negative seventh, right? I mean, there is one times 10 to the negative seventh in there, but that number is so small that it's pretty much negligible. And with it being so small, the only way that this reaction can proceed is to proceed towards putting more than one times 10 to the negative seventh ions in solution. So we're gonna proceed it to the right, which means this is gonna become 0.5 minus X, X and 0.5 plus X. 
Then when I write my Ka, my Ka expression is Ka equals, uh, do I even need to write that out again? You guys understood it from last part. We can skip right over that step. On your test, because I don't ask you to write out the Ka, you can skip right over the step and go straight to this and I will know immediately what it is that you've done. Heck, you could even leave the, the minus X and the plus X off of the, um, the algebra here, off of the expression, and I would still know what you're doing. So the X is being negligible means that we can just kind of forget that they're there. And this just becomes X times 0.5 over 0.5. The two 0.5s even cancel each other out. And so then what we find out is that the X equals 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth. And then the pH equals negative log of 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth. And my calculator says 4.74. Okay. But did you guys just notice that in the last two problems, this one and example one, that because the concentration of the acid and the concentration of the conjugate ion are the same, that really what just happened in this problem, and I think we should write this down in our notes because this is gonna be really important on Monday. When concentration of HA equals the concentration of the anion itself, then pH equals pKa exclamation point. In other words, all we have to do is if we see that these two are in the same concentration, all we have to do is take the Ka value that's given and plug it right into negative log. Don't all jump up at once, but isn't that kind of exciting that you can skip this entire process and just do this? Because uh, I believe I've done that for you on some of the FRQ reviews that you've done already. I think I might even have to get the answer. And when they say on the uh, AP test, justify your response, you don't have to justify it by showing all this work. You can justify it by saying, okay, I'm gonna throw some extra words in here. At the midpoint, the pH equals the pKa. What is the midpoint? The midpoint is when uh, an acid and its conjugate and are in equal concentrations. Now that's also true for a base, a base and its conjugate cation. If they're in equal concentrations, the, P, the POH equals the PKB. All right, I've said too much. Let's just leave it at pH equals PKA. And by the way, this has a special name. It's called the henderson Hasselbach equation. You don't need to write that down right now, but I'm going to be saying that name enough times in the next week and a half that it's just worth it's worth that you know that. All right, let's keep going. I'm fun. Well, didn't we just do this? Oh, we're going to add ah to our buffered solution. We're going to add some base. Good. This is a good problem for us to. Uh, it is not Hasselhoff. I was waiting for somebody to say that. I should give you extra credit for that. Um, it is Hasselbach. Do you know that in the 1990s, David Hasselhoff was the uh, largest actor in the country of Germany. They had some special attraction for David Hasselhoff that he actually came over there and actually was a singer, came over there and was a performer not just a uh, TV star of Knight Rider and I think Baywatch, right? So apparently the, there's something about those shows that really struck a chord with the Germans. I don't know what it is. Even though when I was a kid, I really liked the show Knight Rider. That was a good show, but I was a kid. I wasn't an adult. All right, I got 15 minutes, let's keep moving. All right, so what do we know right now about this solution is, all right, where do I even start this one? Uh, I guess what I'm gonna start by doing is instead of writing the equilibrium expression for this, I'm gonna start by writing down this. And this is really gonna help us. This is like a good first step towards 
Tuesday or towards Monday when uh, we get to some rather lengthy procedures that we have to do. The first thing that happens in this reaction is that we have to have a neutralization of the base of the fact that there is 0.01 moles of hydroxide put into the solution, okay? So because we added sodium hydroxide, before we can even talk about reaching equilibrium, the first thing that has to happen is neutralization. Just like we did back in chapter four, this is something that you guys have already done, all right? So in order to neutralize, what I need to know is how many moles of hydrogen ions are attached to the acetic acids. Why do I care about that? Because the rest of this reaction, which is going to form water and acetate ions, there's no place else for me to get my hydrogen ions. You might be thinking, hey, Mr. Purser, couldn't we get the hydrogen ions from water's dissociation? The problem is water's dissociation only put one times 10 to the negative seventh molar of them in there. And we've got like 10,000 times more hydroxides put in because of the base. So who's gonna neutralize that base has to be the acetic acid. Vinegar will react with sodium hydroxide. So I need to know how many moles of acetic acid are present. So the fact that they tell me there's a one liter solution I refer you back to where we did this before, and I told you I would never write this down again. Here I am writing it down again. If you multiply one liter times 0.5 moles per liter, you get that there are 0.5 moles of acetic acids present. Okay, now acetic acids, when they hit water, they start trying, they start trying to dissociate into their ions. Every single time a hydrogen ion pops off of an acetic acid, a hydroxide is there to greet it. And that hydroxide is going to keep reacting until it's completely gone. So if we say that this is at the start, then we can say at the finish, I'm not going to call it at the equilibrium, at the finish, we're going to use up from 0.5, we're going to use up 0.5 minus one. Should I have put a now I'm just gonna go straight to it. 0.49 moles is still left over. Zero moles of this is now still there because it's the limiting reactant. And now we've put 0 0.01 moles of acetate ions into solution, okay? Now there already was acetate ions in solution. So um, I wanna now start looking at this reaction, because now that I have neutralized my acetic acid until all of the hydroxides are gone, this reaction is ready to start reaching its equilibrium. But as you guys already know, this has to be written like that. This has to be written like that and I don't get to put in 0.5 and 0.5 because that's not how much of each of the things that are present. So I don't know, maybe over here, I should do the same thing. One liter contains 0.5 moles per liter means that there already were 0.50 moles of acetate in solution before we even started, just like there was 0.5 moles of acetic acid in the solution before we even started. And then the hydroxides started neutralizing with the H's until they were completely gone. And now we're at a point where there are 0.51 moles of acetate ions and 0.49 moles of acetic acid in solution. So how is that as a molarity? I don't like the way I wrote this. I'm gonna put an equal sign. I'm gonna put plus this plus this, so that if you look at this later on in your notes, that you know that that was not a division sign. That was just me adding these two numbers together. They should have been right above each other. It would have been a cleaner way of writing it, but it is what it is, and I only have 10 minutes left. So to find out what the concentration is, you take your number of moles and you divide by the number of liters, which happens to still just be one liter because we didn't add any extra volume to this, and our concentration is 0.49. Over here, when you take the 0.51 moles and you divide the fact that it's in a one liter solution, that tells you that we have 0.51 molar. 
Why did I waste the time with doing that when I could have just told it to you? Because on Tuesday, Monday, on Monday, we will have to actually add whatever solutions were mixed together is going to increase the volume. So we're going to have to divide by something different than one liter. If you would have added liquid sodium hydroxide, aqueous sodium hydroxide would have changed the volume. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Purser, you're right. Okay, now let's proceed to equilibrium. 0.49 minus x, x, 0.51 minus, ah, plus x. Mr. Purser, do we need to put the brackets around that every single time? It's kind of cumbersome. For my chapter test, no. On the AP test, I wouldn't take any chances. Have you guys been watching the videos that I've been sending out? I hope you have. I know some of you have. And you, I'll grade my AP, my AP FRQs. And on one of them, I got one out of four. That hurt my feelings. On other words, other ones, I get like five out of eight, six or seven out of eight. So I, therefore, I know that I can still get a five on the AP test. But as an AP chemistry teacher that is taking a test that is written by other AP chemistry teachers, they're not smarter than I am. They don't know more. Well, some of them might know some more chemistry than I do, but for the most part, we're all the same. So how come I'm not getting perfect scores? Because they're so freaking picky. So therefore on your test, you do everything the way you've been taught properly from your textbook, and then you're safe, okay? The, the steps that you skip because of me could be costly on your AP test, just not on your chapter test. All right, you guys are ready to solve this now, right? We can say the Ka, 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth equals x times 0.51 divided by 0.49. This time you can't just cross them out. Uh, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. That was, that was cheap. I didn't even use brackets. 0.51 plus x and 0.49 minus x. And now you can cross out the x's and then this time you have to actually multiply by 0.49 to the other side and divide by 0.51 to the other side to get your x. So yes, you do have a little bit more math to do, but you can handle it. When you do it, hey, I actually did this out in a series of, of steps here. Maybe this looks cleaner and you're like, yeah, I appreciate that. There's what I got for x. And then the pH is negative log of that number. Um, notice how much the pH changed by compared to what we did in example two. The pH in example two was 4.74, and the pH only changed by 0.02. Why? Because with the buffered solution, the buffered solution has two things in it that are ready to react with whatever you add, acid or base, and not let the pH change by very much. So basically, they're I don't know, I shouldn't say this while, while we're on uh, a recording. They're basically cock blocking the hydroxides or the hydrogen ions, right? One of them is going to do that. They're like your parents when a, when a, a prospective suitor comes over, right? I'd like to date your son or daughter. And then one of the two parents is gonna play a uh, bad cop, right? That's basically what a buffered solution does. It doesn't allow the pH to change by very much. Good analogy, huh? Now, I think I have one more example here, but you guys get the idea of this now, right? So even though it's, I mean, we still have six minutes, we could do this quick. You're like, no, skip it, okay? If you wanna skip it, chapter 15, homework number one is your assignment. I'm gonna just write this down, calculate the pH of a lactic acid solution. So uh, I know that because they gave me a Ka and they talked about an acid, that what I wanna do is write my lactic acid as forming hydrogen ions and lactate ions. All right, and that initially, if we have 0.75 molar of this and 0.25 molar of this and zero hydrogen ions, negligible amount, that this reaction is gonna to proceed to the right. And when it does so, when it reaches equilibrium, it's gonna be 0.75 minus X x and 0.25 plus x and then our ka 1.4 times 10 to the negative fourth equals x 
times 0.25 plus X over 0.75 minus X. X is being negligible, means that you can just pretend that it's not there, but you can't pretend this one's not there because it's being multiplied. And then you're gonna times 0.75 and divide by 0.25. Or somebody might say, could we just multiply times three? Of course. And then solve for X. Once you have your X, then you plug it into your pH equation in 3.38. Thank you for your attention. You're good people. I enjoyed seeing you on Monday. I would like to see more of you, but I'm not gonna hold you to it. Nobody needs to worry about like the fact that just because I'm, I'm um, you know, pressuring you and bullying you. I'm not. I would just love to see more of you because you're good people, right? And uh, it's totally, totally safe here right now. I'm really pleased with what I've been seeing. So um, that's that. Chapter 15 homework number one. Those are your questions right there. You can see they're all related, okay? So as you go through this assignment, please uh, watch how questions two, three, four, and five all kind of relate to each other and how the pHs work. And then even look at my answer slides uh, because I, on the very last slide, actually show it on there, but it might not make sense the way I've kind of made a graphing tree of it. But anyway, they're all related. I'll leave it on this slide in case anybody needs to finish copying that. And I'm going to stop the recording.